Hello and welcome to the Celtic History Podcast with me, Liam Kelly. Today I'm joined by Matt Kaur, who's a Celtic Park tour guide and an author. He's written multiple Celtic books now. Uh, so welcome to the show, Matt, and thanks for coming on. Hi, Liam. Hi, Liam. My pleasure. Um, so we're, Matt's on the show today to talk to us all about his latest book, which is a biography about the life and times of Harry Hood, a famous Celtic striker. Um, so I sort of kick off the podcast today, Matt, by just asking you to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. See, I've mentioned that you, you've worked at Celtic Park as a tour guide um, and written a few books. So um, just tell the listeners a little bit more about your yourself and your Celtic kind of background. Yeah, certainly. Well, I guess first and foremost, uh, Celtic, Celtic fan, man and boy, lifetime passion. Uh, first went along to Celtic Park uh, mid-60s with my dad. The usual sort of rite of passage thing uh, around the time of the Lions. So managed to watch all those wonderful, th- you know, wonderful sides through the years. Now taking, now taking my own kids to the game. So uh, in terms of in terms of work, when I retired from I had a career in business, when I retired, I uh, I got a job in the Celtic Park doing the stadium tours, which is now sort of three years we've been doing that. And also one of the other passions that I wanted to indulge in was to write about Celtic. So. I guess, long story short, I started writing some small articles for the, the Celtic Star uh, on games or seasons or individuals. And from there, uh, completed the first book, which is the story of the Invincible Treble. Uh, that, was, that would be around springtime last year. And then with yourself and, and David Porter, we, we completed the compilation, Walford and the Bow Boys, really looking at you know, the founding fathers, the early years, early heroes of Celtics, so they're a completely different book from Invincible. Uh, and that's done really, really well, completely sold out from the Celtic star perspective. Uh, and then I've started looking at the other project we've been working on pretty much this entire year, as you mentioned earlier, has been Harry, Harry Hood. So I guess the story about Harry is uh, a, bit, a bit closer, close to my heart. Harry's a, a boy brought, you know, born and brought up not far from myself and is a wee lad going to see Celtic. Uh, in the 70s, then I was actually going, a lot of the, the men on the bus were actually people who had been at school with Harry or, or neighbours or whatever. So I guess there's always been that. There's, there's always, Harry's been a wee bit extra special as a sort of local boy who played for Celtic. And I guess if you were going to start with doing a biography, then, then who better to start with than the wonderful Harry Hood? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was going to be one of my questions to see what was your inspiration for kind of writing about Harry Hood. So I guess you touched on it there as the kind of local connection and um, yeah. obviously quite a, a big Celtic player as well in a, in a very successful period for the club. Um, so once you'd made the decision for sort of doing the book about Harry Hood, how do you then go about writing a biography? Do you, did you kind of have support from Harry Hood's family or... Um, it, it sort of what was the first sort of steps that you took? Yeah, it was it's an interesting story, Liam, because uh, originally the, the Harry Hood story originally was going to be an article on the anniversary of the hat trick against Rangers back in, in 73. I was conscious of it was coming up, was keen to keen to do something on it. We put a wee bit of work into you know building that story and, and it sort of grew arms and legs. It, not surprisingly, I, I tend to do that with some of the projects, I tend to expand. Uh, Harry's family sort of got in touch. They were asking, you know, A, A, they were really pleased we were doing it. I think they felt it was something special to be doing and also asking, to, you know, if they could share it with family abroad and could we do a written version. And really from there, in the chats from the chats between myself and the family, the prospect was raised of, you know, is there a book here? And, and from there, it's, as I say, it's, it's became this massive project over the, pretty much the entire calendar year. So input from the family, absolutely. First and foremost, the biography was new ground for me, new territory for me. First and foremost, I wanted to make sure that you know the family were on board, also to understand the, I guess, the scope of it. You know, you know, what areas to cover, areas you know to, to focus on, and, and from there it became, I guess, much more than a story about a few seasons, seven seasons at Celtic. It really became the story of Harry's life, and in actual fact, it starts. It starts before Harry. Harry didn't magically appear in the Celtic strip at you know 24 years of age. So started doing quite extensive research into you know the Hood family going back, I guess, a generation before Harry, and then taking it all the way through Harry's life. So a bit of a labour of love, as you can imagine, and all the way through, uh, you know, checking in with the family, sharing some of the thoughts and ideas, getting ideas and input from them, 
uh, and the finished article, finished article, if you like, is very much a you know a, a shared view, if you like. So it's uh, without the family, I'm not sure there would have been an autobiography. A biography uh, certainly wouldn't have been done the, the way we've done it here. So you know, invaluable support and help from them, which is greatly appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I I think that obviously for a lot of football fans and particularly with Celtic fans, we always you know, remember players for who they were as a as a footballer or maybe even some of the characteristics on the pitch. Um, but there's a whole obviously other kind of side of a person that, um, you know, if you don't have that access to the family or to the individual, then um, you can't capture that. So, I mean, it'd be nice to find out more about his life kind of away from football and before football um, to get that kind of picture of not just himself, but of his upbringing and of the whole... Uh, Hood family as well. Um, I say a lot of the time in different kind of projects that I've done, when I research, you know, different players or different teams, you start to get a feel for some of the individuals just from different news stories away from the pitch. But to actually have that real close uh, kind of contact with the family uh, must have been able to sort of get you some kind of unique information and a really good insight for people. Um, but sort of beyond the family, I understand as well that you've spoken to some of Harry's former teammates as well, um, and quite iconic figures such as Kenny Dalglish as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the book was sort of written in chronological order, so you've got all the way back. I spoke to folk who spoke to folk who played with Harry in school teams, you believe, include, including Jim McCallagh. Harry played for, for Holyrood, and he, he played the same team as Dennis Conan, who later obviously joined him at Celtic, and also. Uh, without 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 uh, a spoiler alert here, Jim McCallum sort of comes into the fray as well. So lovely, lovely man talking away to Jim about his experiences and his memories. And then Harry also played. He played at junior level with St Rocks. Played with Clyde in two spells. Played with Sunderland. So all all, all of those clubs, even before he got to Celtic Park, there's some incredible stories about Harry and you know a lot a lot of love and respect for Harry as a, as a player and as a man. So, as I say, huge support from the clubs. We talk, came, obviously, once we got to Celtic in 69, we start looking at some of the players that were, you know, we'd be playing with Harry around about that time. As you say, Tommy Callaghan, but you mentioned Tommy first. Tommy Callaghan was my, my first port of call. I know he'd been, he'd been a roommate of Harry's for years. If, if cash your mind. Well, you, you'll be too young to cash your mind back, but we, uh, listeners of my vintage will recall that Tommy and Harry joined Celtic, around about, you know, with six months apart. Very similar in terms of signing. They'd been around the Scottish scene for a few years and joke, jokes didn't sign many players. When they did, he tended to get it right. So they sort of logically bonded. And Tommy's a lovely man, still, still working at Celtic Park, as folk will probably know. And he gave me a lot of time and a lot of stories and a lot of feedback. And I guess from there, you start looking, OK, who else? Stop David Hay. Uh, start to look, look at other options. Kendall Leash, as you say, the Kendall Leash one's a bit surreal, sitting working away on the book. One day, and my mobile phone goes, and it's uh, then you know don't recognise the number coming up. Hello, hi, it's Kenny here. <laughs> so I'm thinking it's my son at the wind up, but uh, absolutely, it was, it was kind of least taking time out from his holiday to you know share some time, spend share some thoughts, a few chuckles about his time with, with Harry, and it was so that, that was as a guy who worshipped Kenny as a teenager and probably broke my heart when he signed for Liverpool, probably still in rehab, getting over that. To, to have Kenny to have Kenny phone you in your mobile and just say hi it's Kenny like he's your like he's your, your pal for the pub is quite surreal so uh, Wally Wallace from Australia uh, as I say Dennis Conaghan I mentioned earlier again a lovely man could go all the way back to the teens memories clear as a bell and, and it gave me in my opinion I'm biased obviously but in my opinion it's gave me you mentioned a unique insight I reckon I've well, spoken George Hare heard at Sunderland you know Dick uh, Dick State uh, John McHugh, Graham McFarlane, all guys who played the Eric Clyde, people who are because there's a lot of love, a lot of love for Harry with Clyde, obviously two spells there, and that love was reciprocated. These guys again could just give you stuff that you just I've been through every newspaper for every day, going away back to the late 1950s. But some of this stuff is only exists in people's head. And sadly, all the people who played at the same time as Harry are no longer with us. But for those that I managed to speak to, it was absolutely fascinating and hopefully. You know, the people who buy the book will, will enjoy the stories. As you say, family. Harry's got family all over the world. I spoke to, you know, relatives in America. Uh, Harry's schoolboy 
friends from, you know, from Springburn and from Balornock. And then another thing I guess about Harry is he's quite unique in the fact that two, you, you could always, you could argue, I don't know if there's an argument in it, that Harry had two careers, you know, he had a fabulous football career to come all over the world. But then when he left football, you know, many players buy pubs or have businesses of some extent. But Harry, you know, Harry took that a stage further in my view. He's built up this, you know, empire or legacy of Lisanay, the, the pub and hotels. And a lot of folk will know Harry from that as much as they'll know him from the football. So quite a quite a unique character, even before you delve into the family that he came from, which again, without spoiling it, there's there's some fascinating stories in there. So a bit of a labour of love, uh, an incredible story. And hopefully, one that people will enjoy. Yeah, I mean, as you say as well, some of his life after football. There's a friend of mine, similar age to me, so in his mid twenties. Um, and when I mentioned the name Harry Hood, the first thing he'd said to me wasn't actually about football. It was the fact that um, he knew that he'd owned, I think it was like three restaurants in Blantyre that he mentioned. Um, yes. oh. So, so there's that that whole side. So he he became aware of his football story after. Um, knowing about his business involvements in the local area, um, but I say I, I was I was going to uh, mention that I'd seen on social media that you posted a few kind of things about Harry Hood in his youth kind of football days, um, yeah. and obviously you've you've mentioned there that you'd spoken to people that had played with him as a schoolboy uh, that had been involved with him at Clyde and everything. So it's obviously given a good picture for people that not just his career kind of at Celtic in those kind of seven years that um, a lot of our supporters will know about. It, it's built up that whole picture of, of his life. And I find it particularly fascinating to think of the youth football and, uh, you know, some of the stories from back then to think how youth football's kind of changed from, from back then compared to now. Because, I mean, youth football in that era, particularly at Celtic, I know he didn't come through at Celtic, but um, yeah. even, even across Scotland in that era was a really successful time um, for, you know, if you look at the players that have come through that were playing for Leeds in the 70s that were from Scotland, obviously the Celtic team, the Rangers team, Stephen Kilmarnock had strong sides. Um, so that would be something that I think a lot of people and especially myself would be really interested to find out more about really. Um, I mean, as you say, you've mentioned, you know, several Celtic teammates and See the the most kind of standout one, Kenny Dalglish, that you'd spoken to. Yes. So although that gave you a great insight into Harry Hood himself, uh, I imagine that must have kind of given you a really good understanding of what the Celtic dressing room as a team was actually like at that time. Obviously, with Jock Steen in charge and at a really well, the most successful period of Celtic's history. Um, you know, obviously, just slightly after Lisbon. Uh, so. I mean, was there, was there a lot of stories from teammates about the, the dressing room, the kind of wider Celtic sort of story at that time? Yeah, well, even, even talking talking to Kenny about that, because, you know, we, if you look at the dates, Kenny, Kenny actually joined, it was that Kenny volunteered, he, he actually joined Celtic, he joined the Celtic ground staff the same month as Lisbon, which, although I'd always related Kenny with joining Celtic in 1967, in my head, he joined after Lisbon, but Kenny was was able to point out at least him and Danny McGrain, you know, Paul Wilson, these guys actually came on to the, the coaching staff at the same time as the, the Celtic won the European Cup. And, and with it, so Tommy, one or two other players had made the same, uh, Willie Wallace had made the, the, the same comment as well. This, if you consider that if you consider that the Quality Street gang were in essence the replacements for the Lisbon Lions, you would think automatically there's a bit of rivalry and whatever, but he, the players I've spoken to regarding that time, without you know, without exception, talk about the fact that the Lisbon Lions couldn't have done it, couldn't have done enough to bring them forward. They were fantastic characters. And Kenny was saying there was a there was a that was a, there was a home dressing room and an away dressing room. The Lions get trained this is at Celtic, so obviously at that time they were trained at Barrafield, long, long before uh, Lennox Town. So that the, the the Lions, if you like, would train and would get ready and get organised in the home dressing room, and then the, the Quality Street gang and the visitors. And then, you know, Kenny, George Connolly, these guys, once you start coming through there, there's that, there's that uh, time where you're a wee bit quiet, just waiting to be, you know, feeling your way, I guess, in terms of, you know, in terms of the dressing room spirit. It says, but one of the things was, you really had, you had to sort of come out your shell. You know, you had to, you know, be able to, you know, give some part or be able to take some. 
because that was that was that environment. But the, the, they spoke they spoke so highly about the guys that were there at that time, the folk that took them under their wing, and uh, also Willie Fernley. It's another one. Willie Willie Fernley was the coach at that time. Yeah. So Willie was absolutely brilliant with the with the youngsters, and again, you know, Willie Fernley, a man we dearly dearly love. But you, you don't always relate Willie with that with that era, but he was absolutely in there. Before. I think he moved on to Commander to become the manager of Commander a year or two later. But he was very much. My, my view is the Lisbon team absolutely revered, uh, right, rightly so. But there's a period then between, I don't know, 67, 69, 70. If you look at the, the Celtic team photos around that time, the, the, the quality in the squad is is quite breathtaking. The, one of the challenges, one of the, the biggest challenge, surely, for Joe Steen, God rest him, must have been, how, how, how did you keep that, you know, how do you keep that dressing room happy? If you look at the attacking talent, it was fighting for, you know, what, five places every week. It's, it's just quite incredible. In my view, I, I'd love, I'd, I'd love, the challenge, I guess, for me would be, is, was, there, was there ever a time with the Celtic squad, the Celtic could have created, I don't necessarily just mean a first 11, but a greater squad. How, how, how you picked a team every week from that beggar's belief? So, yeah, they all spoke, so I guess the initial point, they all spoke very, very, K- K- Kenny talked about that time with great, great affection, which was lovely to hear. I mean, it's 50 years ago. He was recalling things and incidents that, you know, as if they happened last week. So, so, so somebody like me, are sort of goggle-eyed, you know, just uh, taking some of these things in, you know, some some of these uh, comments in. Wonderful stuff. I mean, I get the sense that as well as having a great team, the whole coaching staff and not just Jockstein and Sean Fallon, so but the likes of Bob Rooney and um, you mentioned Steve Willie Fanny, all these different characters in the background really made the club tick and kept the, yeah. the dressing room kind of going um so that that must be great to have come across things like that so to the story kind of broadens from harry hood into some of the wider kind of context as well um obviously harry hood was as you said playing for clyde before he came to celtic um yeah. did did he ever play against the lisbon lions would he have been you know in the clyde team at, at that time yeah, absolutely, and just yeah, absolutely. You go right back. Harry, Harry was playing against the Celtic from 1964. Yeah, and one of the photos in the books is a brilliant photo. It's Harry, Harry Shawfield against Tommy Gemmell and, and Big Jim Kennedy back in '64. And uh, then they obviously went. You mentioned earlier they went to they went to Sunderland, played down there. He actually, he actually played against the Celtic with Sunderland on Jim Baxter's debut. In 65, again, my dad and my brother were, were at, would you believe, and again, we still have the programme for here. So it was, it was actually one of the, Ian McCall. Ian McCall was a Scotland manager and moved to take over the, the job at Roker Park. And it, was one of, it was one of the relatively few games he played under Ian McCall there. It just, that, that particular relationship didn't seem to work. But the game, he stood in for George Herb, who I think was injured the day before. Uh, so Harry's name wasn't in the programme, but Harry and Jim Baxter played against Celtic in a side who won 5 0 at Roker Park back in 65. Then you mentioned the Lions, so he comes back to comes back to Clyde, come back to Glasgow in October 66. And again, that, that Clyde team, for those again in my vintage, you'll remember the Clyde team under Davy White, who'd been a player with Harry in the, in the first spell at Shawfield, they, they actually finished third in the league in the, the season that Celtic, that Celtic won the lot. And in the semi final of the Scottish Cup, eh, Celtic and Clyde get paired together. And the, the first game finished uh, in a goalless draw. Harry actually took, took, a, took a, a foot injury early on in some like nine stitches inserted, but he played on. He played on for 90 minutes, but missed the replay. Uh, and Celtic, you know, Celtic won the replay and Julie beat Aberdeen in the cup final. So Clyde, Clyde were a match away from you know Scottish Cup final in 1967. And Clyde fans that I've been talking to will argue that had Harry been in the team, they may well, they may well, have, they may well have been there. And that that cup that nil nil game on the Saturday was the only domestic cup tie that season that Celtic didn't win. They won all the league cup ties, sectional games, all the way through, and all the Scottish Cup without one exception. Uh, so it's quite it was quite an achievement. If as I say, they finished third in the league behind Celtic Rangers, sort of because of a, a weird rule at that time in terms of the Fair Cities Cup, which was the predecessor of the FA Cup. Only one side from from Glasgow, only one side from each city could compete in Europe could compete in that tournament and because Celtic obviously were in the Champions Cup as a as the as the title holders, Aberdeen went into the Cup Winners Cup as runners up at Hamden and then Rangers and Hibs 
had qualified for the league to the FA Cup. So Harry and the Clyde team were actually sort of done out of a place in Europe because of a rule that was subsequently changed. So they must have been a tremendous side at that time to, to finish third. You mentioned earlier, the same the, the year that they finished third, you get teams like Kilmarnock in the semi-final in European tournaments, the Fernland high flyers, you know. And ironically, the team that took Clyde's place in Europe the following year, Dundee, also went, also went to the semi, I think, they beat the Leeds. So it's, uh, it was a fantastic, I must it's a, Scotland also won at Wembley, you might, you, you'll have read about, I'm guessing, maybe Jim McCallog and Bobby Lennox in the score, sweet, Billy Wallace in the park. It was, yep. it's probably, it's probably the peak time, 1967, even taking Lisbon, you know, not in isolation, 1967 is probably just about as good as it gets for Scottish football, they were really punching above their weight. So yep. and Clyde, Clyde were very much part of that, in, in, in my opinion. I think as well, um, Hibs went quite far in the European Cup as well. I think they were, is it 65 or something? 64, it was quite, I know it was early. Um, I think before Celtic had, had ever played in the European Cup, that Hibs had um, represented Scotland in that and gone quite far. So there's a whole you know, array of Scottish teams that were doing well uh, you know, on the continent. And then that shows see, how strong the domestic scene must have been and then for Clyde to finish third um, because that was something that had just kind of come up in our conversation here when I thought had Harry Hood you know, been successful at Clyde had he played against Celtic that type of thing I, I hadn't actually um, you know considered that even before you know coming on to discuss this whole book today um, so just I suppose if he had that successful time at a relatively small club by comparison to Celtic, then that must have given him a lot of confidence kind of coming into that dressing room as you know, as tough as it still must have been to be competing with, you know, other players of the standard that we had at that time. No, no, you, you, you're spot on. When Harry came into the team, he's also this remarkable knack of scoring on his debut. So and, and again something that you, you talked about confidence there, one of the sort of recurring themes. When you talk to the, the guys going way back to his days at Queen's Park as a 16-year-old and whatever, and maybe even earlier than that in the, the Brunswick Cup in Ballonock, they said one thing Harry never liked. He, he wasn't he wasn't a big he wasn't a show he wasn't a showy man or a, a loud man or a boastful man, but he had a lot of confidence in his own ability. And you're right to, to survive. That's one thing that Ken Lewis really highlighted to survive in that environment. You just couldn't do it. You, you just couldn't do it without that degree of confidence. But so sort of Harry came in. He made his debut at Love Street. Uh, and he scored. Uh, you know, you start looking through played his first league cup tie. He scored the Scottish Cup. Blah blah blah. Every time he came on a European, he had his European debut. He came on. He was uh, on the bench in Switzerland against Bal, but he actually started the European game for the first time uh, against FC. But I'll call them Bal because the, the spelling seems to have changed over the years. FC Basel was are now known. Harry came on at Parkhead and scored his first European goal within sixty seconds of his. Of his European debut, so I guess if you're going to, you know, if, if you're going to try and make an impression, there's, 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 there's worse ways of doing it than that. So the other thing you talked on earlier, uh, just sticks in my mind before I lose it, Liam, was you talked about broadening the story out, and that's exactly right. So you're talking, you know, you're looking at Harry, but you can't tell Harry's story without looking at the games and in, in, in some detail and the other characters around about him. They sort of they're all part, they're all part of Harry's story. So it's. I think I think that enhances the book because if you look at Harry at that period, then inevitably you're looking at the majority of the lines. You're looking at the the quality street gangs that come through. I mean, George Conley's probably the first one to come through, but guys like David Hay, another lovely man that gave us lots of time and you know great information, great background, great insight. These guys, Lou, you know, around the time Lou McCarry, Danny McGrain, you know, Kenny himself. It was a you know, was, there's some wonderful characters there. So to tell Harry, you can't tell Harry's story in isolation, I guess, is the point I'm making. It's you inevitably delve into Harry was replacing th this chap here or he was stepping down and let him come in. So it's, it allowed me to, again, I've talked about a labour of love a couple of times. It allowed me as well to reminisce about some of these games. So a lot of the games you can talk about, there's some research obviously going away back. Uh, but some of the games, many of the games, I guess, I guess pretty much... All of Harry Hood's games at Celtic, for example, I would have been there. You know, they've been there, or you know, either in person or watching it on TV. If it was a, you know, a cup tie just before I was of that age, so it was allowed allowed me to bring some of my memories back to you know, 
and also when we've been sharing some of that in social media, that's a, that's a kind of lovely feedback we're getting that says, oh, that was really nice. It's, I'd forgotten about that game. I'd forgotten about that character or that, or that incident, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, like for me, obviously I'm born a long time after these games have been played, but um, my dad had got a video um, from the club centenary season when the club released a, a history video. Um, yeah. And I grew up watching that. And I remember, you know, lots of the standout games, like different cup finals against Hibs. Um, and you yes. have like so, so you'd have players that I'd seen footage of, like Dixie Deans, Lou Macari, Kenny Dalglish. And then I, and yeah. then you just start to click all of these players for forwards. And there's obviously only a certain number of positions up there available. And yet they're all quite iconic figures in the club's history. So they've all managed to be a success and they've all therefore managed to get sufficient game time. And even yeah. if you think of like the wide areas, because if, if I'm right in saying that we would have played probably with like sometimes it sort of along the lines of like a front five with like um, outside rights and outside lefts that, um, you know, had the likes of Jimmy Johnson on one side, you'd even have Bobby Lennox could go out to the wide left. Um, So even then the wide areas were quite, uh, you know, full of talent as well. So it's not as if you could just easily accommodate these sort of more central strikers um, by pushing them out wide. So it's uh, quite fascinating to think of the talent that we had then. And in, in a way, it's a shame that the, the quality street gang didn't come through just slightly later so that we could have spread it out across, you know, had, had the Lisbon Lions and then had the, the quality street gang at a slightly later time to push that European success right through to the late 70s as well. Um, yep. Yep. You see, when so Harry had see, made an immediate impact at Celtic scoring on say his debut, scored on like his first cup games. Um, he'd played in Europe quite early on and scored as well. So, yep. And although he won you know hundreds of trophies or you know several trophies at Celtic, so he was no doubt an overall success. Definitely, he still had some setbacks that I looked at. Um, yep. In a sense that like the 1970 European Cup run where we got to the final, so he didn't play in the semi-finals and he was on the bench in the final as well. So he missed yeah. out on that. But then he went the following season, um, went on to score over 30 goals, um, was the club's top goal scorer. And he was heavily involved in the title win that season. I think he scored um, on the day that we won the title. Um, he'd scored in that game. And then... So the following season, we play into Milan in the European Cup semi-final again, 72. Um, and he missed out in that in that tie through injury. Obviously, the game went to penalties. And the tie went to penalties, um, the second leg at Celtic Park. And see, Harry Hood would have been a penalty taker. So it's that sort of constant thing of um, the real big moments of these late European ties where he'd missed out twice uh, and then he obviously gets to play uh, against Atletico Madrid in the 74 European Cup semi-final um, so every time he's had a some some kind of either setback or so his disappointment it hadn't affected him at all really he kept coming back and um, you know making making amends or um, still getting another opportunity at that level. Um, so, I mean, there must be so many great stories from his Celtic career with those those kind of teams that we've played in. It's, it's the last time, really, that Celtic were in the real late stages of top-level European competition. Um, so there must be so many different games and goals that have come up along the way. Um, but did you have anything to talk about the, the 74... Cup semi European Cup semi final. You see, it's a pretty infamous kind of tie with the way that the Atletico Madrid team behaved in that tie. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But take, take you back a bit. You're right. There was the disappointment of, of missing out in the lead. So Harry was going to talk about the road to Milan, which you know started as I say with Harry's Harry's debut against Basel, and then moved through the Benfica ties. Well, Harry scores an iconic header. He's involved in the Fiorentina in the quarterfinals, but you're, you're right, he misses out in the, in the later stages against Leeds 
in Feyenoord being on the bench. Uh, and there's another story about that, which I won't ruin. But, but again, well worth one I wasn't aware of until I spoke to Harry's family in terms of Milan and, and the aftermath of Milan. And then you're right, the following year, and there's 1970 is, 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 I guess I, I call it, you know, it's a bittersweet season for Harry because there's some real personal, some real personal heartache towards the end of the calendar year, 1970. And then from that, incredibly, it bounces back. You mentioned the top scorer in Celtic. He becomes the top goal scorer, top goal scorer in Scotland. Uh, he scores a, an effective title clinch at Pato. My first trip to Petodre in April of 71. Harry scores within a couple of minutes. It was a, it was a strange scenario where because of games in hand, Celtic couldn't afford to lose the game. If Aberdeen had won the game at Petodre, it would have been, a, I guess, a, an absolute odds-on shot for them to win the title. They'd only one game remaining. And Harry's goal basically allowed Celtic then to play out the remaining three games, you know, with, you know, without without the pressure that they've been involved in, you know, had we lost that day. So that's a big one. And then within a couple of weeks, we have a cup final against Rangers, which goes to a replay. Uh, Harry's got a, a black eye after a collision with, I believe, with the Rangers goalkeeper, and still steps up and takes a penalty kick. He takes a penalty kick at Hamden in front of, you know, 103,000 fans. It, it looks as if it's a training game. Sends. Sends Big Peter for chips, six a ball in the net. So he, he, he effectively scores a goal that clinches the title and wins a double within a few weeks. As I say, having earlier that, that season, suffered some real uh, family heart, heartbreak. So that, that speaks volumes for the man. The following years, you see again, he's doing lots of great stuff. And then he, he, becomes, he gets injured just before the Inter Milan game. And who knows what have transpired. Moving to the, the Atletico game, there's another one. Some, I was at Atletico, I was at Inter. And I was at the, the Atletico game. I'd actually forgotten until I'd done the research. There's, a, there's an incident very early on in that game where Harry actually cuts the ball back in the Celtic breakthrough. It's Harry and Kenny taking a chip, I think, for Tommy Callaghan, believe it or not. So three, three characters very central to the story. Uh, Harry, Harry chases a ball to the, the byline, cuts it back. It's Pepe Reina's dad that's the goalkeeper. And Kenny taps it in. This is within, I don't know, the first five, ten minutes of the game. There's photographs that show the ball is clearly in. But the referee, the referee or the linesman that's allowed to go is and, and give a bad kick to, to Madrid. And obviously the rest is history. They, they literally kicked Jimmy Johnson, particularly black and blue, and Celtic eventually go to Madrid, you know, level pegging in a in a tie they just were never going to win. So it just shows you how, you know, it's a sliding doors thing, isn't it? Harry's goal's given. It, 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 Harry's goal is given and Celtic have a lead to hang on to. You know, it could have been vastly different. And as you say, within a few months, Celtic are knocked out. Uh, Atletico lose the final to, to Bayern. They're actually seconds away from winning the European Cup uh, in Brussels in the final. And then Bayern scores, if you remember, the big centre and a half. Swartzenbeck scores a goal for about 40 yards. And then they, ha- they, they, they really get a hammer on in the replay. They've still never won the, they've still never won the Cup to this, to this day. So maybe there's a certain karma. But anyway, within a few months, you know, time's catching up in that Celtic team. And we get knocked out by Olympiacos. And, and you're right, we've never, since then, We've never reached the, the, you know, beyond the quarterfinal of the big one, the European Cup. So it's, it's, it's a bit of an end of an era. And, if, if, you know, it, it's quite fascinating taking that story through the absolute highs of, you know, European glory to, to I guess, a team that's on its knees back in 74, 75 and, and, and where Harry fits into all that and what he does next kind of thing. So, yeah, it's quite, yeah to say, I, I wasn't actually aware of that disallowed goal against Atletico. Yeah. I mean, I've watched the highlights back so many times and I always I guess what sticks out in the mind is just um you know the incidents with their kind of uh, neck high tackles and that type of thing that was happening and Jimmy Johnson's death threats in the away leg and um yeah. so I completely missed that quite important detail of a disallowed goal um and I mean it must be good as well I won't ask you to go into it because I don't want to uh, you know give too much away from the book but um yeah to get his, you know, from his family or from his teammates to get the insight into how he must have taken some of these setbacks. So what were his feelings after the Atletico um, tie? What, what were his feelings, you know, being left out in the, in the 1970 kind of semifinals and, and then the final, you know, that, because we, we know, um, you know, obviously the, the football inside that he didn't play, but then to actually get, you know, the, the personal stories of how that affected him or maybe didn't affect him, whatever it may be. Um, I think that would be quite an interesting angle for people to be able to read about. 
and say I, I won't um can I ask you to go into that because I don't I want to keep you know some stuff people can can get the book and and kind of explore that for themselves uh, yep. but it's to kind of break from the chronology a little bit mm-hmm. and to go back to like the the uh earlier in the 73 season so um probably Harry Hood's most iconic moment was his hat trick against Rangers at Hamden um yep. so I guess that must feature heavily in the book did you did you have many kind of stories surrounding that game and uh, that obviously particular achievement beyond see the simple fact that it was done that must have been probably a career highlight for Harry Hood well, well absolutely I, I guess I guess not even Harry on well, 5th of December 73 whatever I guess not even Harry would realize just you know what what, what that what that achievement would mean and there's a there's an interesting thing again a bit like Atletico Madrid so, some folk might forget the fact that Harry, Harry scored a hat trick, and within a few minutes of the third goal, he actually scores another goal, which I remember watching. I was, I was, I was still a year away from going to those games at, at that time. I was still in my, my early teens, but I remember clearly uh, watching the game. It was, a, it was a highlight, so whatever it be, sports scene or whatever, a midweek game. And Harry, Harry scores a perfectly good goal immediately after his hat trick. Now, again, I don't think the significance of that has really been recognised. So, you mentioned you mentioned that I think in the last question they're talking about getting insight. So one of the things, obviously, I have to work around is the fact that I wasn't able to interview Harry. But so a lot of the things Harry has is shared with family, shared with friends, and also delving back into news. But you actually get the quotes. You actually get Harry's quotes at the time in terms of what that event was, which was was priceless. And that one, his comment, and he was still making a comment. I guess forty years later, was that goal was never offside. Had that goal stood, and you, you know, you're, you're a historian, I know, there's, there's no, to the best of my knowledge, and I have checked this thoroughly, there's, there's no Celtic player ever, ever scored four goals in that fixture. So how Harry's quite historic insofar as he joined that, you know, he joined that, a catalogue of greats, you know, Jimmy Quinn done it several times. Jimmy McGrory never did it. Jimmy McGrory never managed a hat-trick in that fixture, but gangs like Bobby Lennox, Steve Chalmers, I guess Billy McPhail, even John McPhail in the in the Danny Kay final. So he joins a very small and select list, but had Harry's fourth goal be allowed to stand and he maintained, I guess, right to the end that that goal was, it was, it was a perfectly valid goal. And I've never seen any newspaper uh, comment to say otherwise that the goal was wrongly disallowed. At end of. Harry would, have been, Harry would have been the only Celtic player in history to have scored four goals in that fixture, which, you know, I, I, find, I find it quite sad. He wasn't allowed to, he wasn't allowed that record. So, yeah, I, a, I, I, I read up. I don't know if you knew that, Liam, but there's another wee tip that for you, if you like. It should have yeah. been, been, it should have been four. Never mind the hat trick. I, I had um, read a little bit about that game just because, as you say, it's such a iconic Harry Hood moment, and I, I did know that um, he had that fourth goal disallowed, but it didn't actually click with me that he probably, like, ninety nine percent sure he would have been the only person to have scored four goals against Rangers, um, obviously for Celtic. Um, yeah, I hadn't clicked that because I, I I guess assumed in the early years somebody must have done it. But when you say the likes of McGrory hadn't achieved it, then um, that's a, a real shame that he didn't get to have that kind of accolade. I think Jimmy scored 55 hat-tricks, or 56 if he included his, you know, his eight goals is two. And, and never managed it against Rangers, but you know, always, it's always with these stats, you, you're up there to be shot down. So, I'm yeah, perfectly happy, I'll perfectly happy to stand corrected. But I have researched that, and I can find no trace of anyone scoring more than three for Celtic against Rangers. So, so there you are. Yeah, <laughs> um, so as you say, after he leaves Celtic, so that team, um, you know, peaks in '74, and then the, the club sorts of goes on a slight downward trajectory um and then when Harry Hood eventually leaves Celtic uh, am I right in saying that he went on to America yeah you're absolutely spot on so the American American scouts have been over in Scotland over in the UK trying to sign up talent and and Harry was Harry was picked to go to San Antonio Thunder a year earlier they tried to sign or they thought they had signed uh, Jimmy Johnson would you believe uh, Jimmy eventually I think went to San Jose 
I feel a song coming on. But ha Harry went to San Antonio Thunder and there was a standout there. So the Americans, as you, even at that time, you know, had all sorts of stats going on long before we were doing them, I guess. So you get points for goals and points for assists. And, and Harry was far and away the, you know, the, the top man at San Antonio Thunder in, in Texas. Cap captain by Bobby Moore, would you believe? Uh, San Antonio. But Harry was the main man on target. He missed maybe four or five games because he was still playing with Celtic to sort of April, this is April 76 time, Liam. Yep. So uh, just before the end of the Scottish season and Harry would go across there. So, so he's by far and away, he earned the most points in that season. That was, that was actually San Antonio Thunder's last season. It's a franchise. So the, the following year they were in Hawaii uh, and, and, and Harry was back in Scotland. And then he was joined by his old friend, Tommy Callaghan. And again, that was... Without, without giving the story away, then that was Harry was instrumental in, in Tommy Callaghan getting out and playing. I think Tommy played nine games uh, over, over in the States. And there's all sorts of, you know, famous players working their, I guess, play, you know, playing their trade in the American and the NESL at that time. So another, and Harry took his family out with him. So we had some more adventures and some lovely stories coming back for the kids about what that was like. So yeah, another, from Glasgow to Texas, yeah, that was that was Harry Hood. Always willing to try something else, a wee bit different, and obviously had family in the states. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd be quite interested to see the circumstances of his Celtic exit. I mean, what his family's thoughts on it were, and um, yeah. what his teammates felt, and then obviously Harry's himself um, going by what the family and and others are kind of close to him and said, uh, and then obviously going on to America. Um, being involved with the likes of Bobby Moore and and still being such a success there. That's the whole sort of forgotten part of his career, really, his, his life after Celtic. And then, say, so he comes back to Scotland uh, with Motherwell um, and, and then carries on. Was, was it Queen's Park or... Was it Queen's Park or Albion Rovers? I can't... It was Queen of the South, but... Another... Queen of the South, sorry. <laughs> But when he's when he's in the states, of course, he comes across the one and only George Best. So some lovely stories about uh, Harry in Texas and uh, the, the wonderful George. God rest them. But you're right, he can then come back. Bertie all tried to sign him for Partick Thistle, but he eventually ends up at uh, back at Motherwell and he plays that. Doesn't go as well. So from being a, a first pick at uh, over in you know the star man over in the states, uh, he starts off well at Motherwell, moves on to the periphery a wee bit. In the following season, the following season he moves down to Queen of the South at Palmerston Park, uh, and again roller coaster. You mentioned earlier there's highs and lows of, the, of, of a footballer's career, and Harry then becomes a first pick, an automatic choice for Queen of the South in the second division. You know, scoring goals and play marker. One other thing, maybe I've touched on earlier. You, you talked about you know the sort of two, three, five formation attacking players. So that's that's interesting because. As I'm doing my research and looking at you know the, the various teams he was playing in and who he was playing against, Move, moving from two three five, if you like, to four two four, or if you think about the Lisbon team, I, I would argue the Lisbon team was set up four two four with, with Bertie and Bobby as a, as a midfield four yeah. attackers, you know, and, and pretty much that was the time. <laughs> that was that was actually seen. So a lot of the, the newspaper comments are described that as a as a step back and a step towards negative football that we were only playing <laughs> that we were only playing the four forwards. So I'm having a chuckle. We think about the, the Craig Levine, you know, four-six formation. Or most teams now play the one striker. Uh, in those days, moving from five to four was deemed was deemed a, a move. To, you know, basically a vote for negative football. But you're right. Celtic could all sorts of attacking talent, and the thing is, they could pretty much play anywhere across that line. And I think Steen again, I didn't appreciate it. So he really started looking at how he's picking horses for courses. He's picking teams for certain games. John Hughes would come in, wonderful wig winger. John Hughes would come in when the going was heavy. Bobby Lennox would come in when the going, you know, the going was normal, if you like, the ground was firm because of his pace. Steen was, Steen was basically shuffling his pack constantly to try and, you know, fit these players for the occasion, for the opposition. Harry was blessed in a way that Harry could play as an outright striker. He could, he could play wide or he could play more as a deep line or a provider, which... You know, different people have different views as to where he's, you know, where he's, his best position was, if you like. But uh, and I think being flexible, being flexible in that sense, allowed him to make. If you think about, if you think about that, that fabulous list of attacking talent we had over Harry's seven years, and he still managed three hundred games. 
you know, still managed to, you know, well over 100 goals for Celtic, playing in probably the greatest side, and you know, my opinion, the greatest side, the greatest squad in Celtic's history. Harry played, Harry played 300 games, you know, that sort of speaks to his quality. And the company of guys like the Lions, of, of guys like Kenny and Lou McCarry, Wally Wallace, you know, John Hughes, Bobby Lennox, Jinky, just fabulous talents. Yeah, I mean, to say Celtic as well at that time were almost revolutionising football in a way that it said, obviously I mentioned earlier about teams often playing with the front five and kind of mentioned Celtic uh, within that, that they did that at times. But as you obviously quite rightly point out, that the Lisbon Lions team was basically a 4-2-4 and that was um, you know, more often what what we would play. And so that was something yeah. that was new, um, introduced by Steen. And then he would do other things like put Tommy Gemmell, moved him over to left back as a right footed um, left back yeah. and then encourage yes. the full backs to push forward as well. Because traditionally at that time, full backs would have been um, kind of operating in their own half as total yeah. defensive minded players. And you see now the game's totally changed with full backs almost. Um, sometimes the attacking side of things have almost more important and you know we see that now with even inverted fullbacks and the whole way the game's changed but a lot of these these things is um the attacking style of play like this tick attacker um you know attacking fullbacks change of formations all of that kind of started with that uh jock steen's team round about lisbon moving forward and then obviously um johan cruyff's ajax team Kind of builds on that, and they kind of get credited with the whole total football. But a lot of that, in in my opinion, anyway, a lot of that had kind of come from Celtic first. Yeah, do you know, do you know, Leo, that's a brilliant point. I was I was working in the tours at the weekends, working in the tours on Saturday, and obviously we get to talking about the European Cup and, and you know who wins the European Cup that Celtic won in Lisbon, and, and I made I made I made that very point. Because if you think about where where we were in in sixty seven, where we were in sixty seven, Inter were. I guess the greatest side in the planet, and they were. Although, although Herrera would argue that he was attacking fullbacks, and certainly in Fichetti, he, he's probably got a point. But certainly they were renowned for their defensive. They would win games one 0 you know, and, and coming from behind against them was was you know a difficult job in the planet. And then we have these incredible stats of whatever, for, you know, forty two shots at goal and twenty four on target. So my argument is that Celtic changed. You're, you're spot on. Steen Steen had been doing his work for many years before he, you know, before he took the Celtic job. He was a he was abroad. He was studying guys like Herrera and looking at what they were doing and different ideas. And I, I think, he, you know, very, very innovative, innovative man. And then he brought that, as you say, brought that to Celtic. I guess you could argue he was blessed in a lot of the players he had there. Could You know, there, there was a crop of players eager to learn and, you know, with a lot of talent. Gemmel, you're right, was originally a right back from him. Bobby Murdoch was an attacking player, an inside right and inside left. Pulled back in, had that. Bertie, I think, was a winger. You know, in his early days at Celtic and at Birmingham, and Steen had a wee look and said, "How can I use these? How can I shuffle this back?" And you know, and they, and they came up with the goods. But Celtic, by achieving what they did in Lisbon, in my opinion, it really changed the face of European football and absolutely set the way for first of all Bayern. Uh, sorry, uh, Ajax to come in as you see. Ajax had been doing good things in the background. Uh, Duke of Prague had beat them the year they won in Lisbon, but they hammered Liverpool five uh, one, and then I think Liverpool got a last gas equaliser at Anfield to get a draw. So they were they were up and coming, but uh, Celtic for me paved the way, and you know guys like uh, Renus Michels, at, uh, you know, in, in Ajax, he then he won three European. I guess if I've got one regret, it's it's that Celtic with that fabulous squad they had over, you know, maybe maybe a, a four, you know, three four five year period. We only have one European Cup to show for it, and I really feel that does not reflect just what a fabulous attacking side that was, and what a tactician. Uh, Steen was in that period, and, as you, and after Ajax, as you say, come come uh, Bayern, and then eventually Liverpool with Kenny. Uh, the Kenny. You know they come with a you know a different blend of football again. But Celtic Celtic changed the face of football in the you know the mid sixties for a decade, uh, and the, the fact that we've only got one European Cup really doesn't reflect how influential we were in that time. Uh, bias obviously, but you know I think that stands up to some scrutiny. Yeah, I, I always feel that 1972 was the the one that got away. Um, obviously, going out of the tournament without actually losing the matches over the two legs in the semi final, going out on penalties. Because uh, yeah. I think Celtic v Ajax in the final would have been 
an unbelievable final to have back then. Um, Seventy four is frustrating because of the fact that Atletico Madrid kind of did a racing club on us with the the way they behaved with the death threats and the um, you know ridiculous tactics and just kicking us off the park. But I feel that the the real strongest team that we had was that seventy two season really i mean we dismantled hibs in the scottish cup final uh won the league um but it was obviously i think it was the league cup party this will beat us quite heavily which was a bit of a of a shock but aside from that we only lost something like two or three games in the entire season there um and i, I really feel like that was the season where if we were going to get a second that that would have been the time um and i'm always quite kind of gutted um you know, looking back on that, that the penalty shootout didn't go another way for us. No, I think I think you call that spot on. You're right. But I remember for, for '74, my dad and the our supporters club had actually booked to go to Brussels. So you know, in terms in terms of ones that get away, obviously the the biggie is Milan. You know, Milan was Milan, Milan was Lisbon in reverse, really, wasn't it? I think actually, yeah. knew it was Milan. So Celtic Celtic have been rank outsiders. You know, three years earlier, going up against Internazionale. Whereas in the road to Milan, if you look at if you look at the path to the final and some of the teams we beat, including, you know, it's it's hard to get a flavour now looking back. Just how, I guess, invincible I say Leeds were felt to be. They were chasing, they were chasing everything down south. I think I think I'm right in saying they ended up with nothing. But they were chasing, they were chasing a grand slam down south and were deemed as pretty much unbeatable. And for Celtic to beat them home and away. And I and I wait probably hurt us again. Look, when I was doing my research, uh, it came up a couple of times that Steen all the way through the draw, Steen was saying keep Leeds for the final. Is as, as far back as you know Benfica, Steen was saying keep Leeds for the final. I mean, what what about that for confidence? But also was saying <laughs> keep Leeds for the final. We'll take basically he wanted he wanted Feyenoord in the semi. Uh, he wanted Feyenoord, and despite the fact that Feyenoord had beat AC Milan, who who were the holders and who'd knocked Celtic out the previous year, there was almost disregarded. It was almost seen as a bit of a, you know, a freak result that they'd done that. Steen wanted them in the semi over two legs and then Leeds in the final. And again, you always wonder, it's a flux, isn't it? You, you wonder how that would have panned out. But your point about 72 and 74, I, I totally agree with. Looking at the, I, I'm, I'm, the my, one of my favourite games, perhaps my my favourite game of my childhood was the 6-1. Was the uh, it was the 6-1 final over Hibs. Dixie was, Dixie was my hero at the time, and of course, to get a hat-trick. And Hibs, in many people's eyes, were the favourite to win that game because they they had a tremendous side at that time. They'd a bit, they, they did win the league. They did beat us in the league cup final. You know, within I guess four or five months, they did get that with Stanton and Rock, that wonderful side. If for I Celtic, remember, oh, so, sorry, carry on. Was for, for Celtic to, to take six off that Hibs side, that was just. It was also the first time I'd, I'd seen a few cup final defeats. Sadly, I was at that Thistle one. Still, still in rehab from that. I'd been at the Aberdeen Bobby Davison one. So. Finally, to get the, the sort of monkey off the back and, and win the cup, it's a remarkable day. And I sometimes I look back in that people people have different views. I sort of look at that as is maybe the, it was the last great I don't know last great occasion Celtic occasion where they were really but I really felt Celtic were a European force. Although we won doubles after that with Harry and you know indeed beyond it, I, I, I do I'm not, I don't believe we've played better than we did that season. I think that was that was an incredible side. That was the Glacier's first season. So he sort of came from nowhere at the, right at the start in the driver of the cup, scoring four goals against the Barton, and he, he never looked back. You know, he played, I think he played three games at Ibrox in a month, and they, we, we won them all. I think Kenny scored them all. And the police went from being a, you know, from being a, I guess, a promising younger, I think it was originally viewed as Bobby Murdoch's replacement at right, right half, from being a promising wing half to being an absolute superstar striker and a national player. So... 1972 is a year right. And Inter Milan was the, the Inter Milan night was a sore one. As a wee boy sitting watching that, it's can you believe it? You're right, you're a penalty kick away to the European Cup. Ajax were a tremendous side. The final was in Rotterdam, but my goodness, what an occasion that would have been. And I, I never quite feel we reached those, I never feel, feel quite feel we reached those heights again eh, under Jock. People all have different views, but that's mine. The, the team that played Atletico was not as strong, in my opinion, as the team that played against Inter. Even though we were, even though we were a game away from the final in the, in the same way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked into the '72 Scottish Cup final as well, yeah. and uh, from memory, I think that Bobby Lennox was on the bench; that he didn't make the 
the starting eleven, and then you had players like George Connolly and that that had come through with uh, with yeah. starting in the midfield. And I was just looking at it, and it, like, every single player was just a superstar. And then yeah. when you've got players like Lennox that couldn't make the starting eleven, just thinking this is a ridiculously good team. Yeah. And uh, as good as the Lisbon Lions were, if you've then got a striker like Kenny Dalglish uh, in the mix as well around this time it's it's just getting to ridiculous levels of talent um, yeah. a couple of guys to, sort of really, like, the other thing obviously Dixie get the headlines but the, I always feel that the I guess the, the, the engine room that day I think Tommy Callaghan was wearing 11 so you, I think Bob, Bobby was the plane Lou McCarry was playing but, uh, Bobby mugged up in Tommy Callaghan or in the midfield, and I always think that was one of Tommy Callaghan's. So I'm not saying that Tom, Tommy obviously has written a forward, and he's you know I've grown quite close to him over the last you know few few months. And, I, and I've said that to him. I've just said I I think that that day Bobby Murdoch was putting balls, and you know Dixie said Tommy sent a couple through. Jim Craig scored. He created a couple of goals for for Lou McCarry at the end. It was a, a fabulous attack in this play. But uh, Tom, Tommy and Bobby in the engine room. Were, were instrumental that day as well, and I guess the same way that Tommy and Bertie had been in Lisbon. And ironically, another thing that people sometimes forget is Bertie came on as a sulphur hives that day <laughs> against yeah. Celtic in the cup final. Which again, you think I was there and I'd forgotten that. Yeah, <laughs> one's a sub, uh, having left having left Celtic the, the beginning of the season. So, so that must that must have been really weird for him. But what, what a wonderful day that was! I'll never forget that. So I found some great photos of the crowd from that day and a few action shots of Jimmy Johnson taking on his man with, you know, the full stands in the background and stuff. There's some really good stuff to look back on. Uh, so just before I go on to the next question, um, when you'd obviously talked about the, the 1970 um, yeah. European Cup run and you said about Leeds, I, I was just going to touch on it, um, yeah. that with me living in the south coast um see down in Bournemouth a lot of my friends parents um are Leeds fans because see the Leeds team was so kind of outstanding at that time that where football wasn't on tv every week and our local teams at Bournemouth were you know low lower down the divisions and Southampton were nothing special at that time um yeah, often teams, often, sorry, often people would pick a team from an FA Cup final that had been on TV um, or, you know, like one of the real standout sides. And so, so many of my friends' parents support Leeds, um, despite living you know, miles away down, right down south. Um, and a lot of them, therefore, you know, have real respect for what Celtic have done in Europe and how big a club Celtic is because they remember that that whole occasion of us not just beating them with the record European attendance in the home leg, but before that going down to Ellen Road and beating them as well. Um, but then obviously as you come down the generations to, um, I suppose, straight after that from the next generation step right down to mine and even the uh, you know kids growing up below me, yeah. they have no idea at all of about what Celtic have actually achieved in Europe. Um, so it's quite, you know, that's something that annoys a lot of people, including myself, really, the sort of disrespect sometimes for um, how big a club and how historic a club Celtic is, that that beating Leeds home and away really kind of cemented our legacy with a, a certain generation of football supporters in England as well. Um, I mean, we've gone on with the run to Seville to beat, I like to Liverpool and Blackburn, but that doesn't seem to hit home anywhere near as much as, uh, you know, that 1970, um, you know, beating them because they, they were seen as like the greatest ever English team and just totally unbeatable. And then to go and do it twice is, um, you know, something that I don't think too many people down here could believe. No, I think it's a good point. I mean, the, much as much as the, the victories over Black, the Black down in Blackburn in particular, what a fabulous night that was. But the, the victories over uh, Blackburn and that Liverpool side, the, the, those sides, those sides would I don't believe would stand. They don't remotely stand in comparison to the Leeds side of the 1970. I mean, at, at that point, I guess Celtic Leeds 
but my, my Ireland fans will probably argue because at the end of the day they won the, they won the trophy. But the, 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 generally, it was recognised that Celtic and Leeds, that the European Cup winner would come from Celtic and Leeds that year. That's, that's yeah. my understanding then, it's still my understanding now. The year before, they talked about the final before the final, and we get these cliches, but the, fight, the year before, it was Celtic and AC Milan. And again, that, that, was settled, that was settled in essence by a mistake at Celtic Park. Uh, and, and I think beyond AC Milan at that time were leaving Celtic Park like they had won the European Cup because although, although they had Man United in the semi and then Ajax funny enough in, in, in the final uh, they, did, they didn't have anything like the trouble uh, beating those sides that they did have uh, beating Celtic and again this isn't just coming from me this is this is quotes from these are quotes from the AC Milan you know Nero Rocco or the AC Milan uh, players at the time to beat Celtic they pretty much thought their name was on the cup. And, and the, the view was, had Celtic won that tie, that was a quarterfinal. Had Celtic won that tie, then Celtic would have won it. I think it was Madrid that year. Celtic would have won the final. So, yeah. So the great, yeah. 68, you know, we sort of blew. I don't remember a great deal about that. Wasn't, wasn't at the game at 68. We sort of get drawn in the a prelim round of the first round against the Russian champions, which was Dynamo Kiev. And the, we, lost the, we lost the first leg at Parkhead. And Bobby Lennox so then. And again, another story of woe in the, in the return. In the return, there's a goal disallowed and a way goal disallowed, which would, you know, potentially have taken Celtic through. You know, in the wake up, they would have had a scare, but we'd still be in the tournament kind of thing. And then, you know, we get Bobby, we get Bobby Murdoch sent off, and the Russians score a goal in the last minute. And all of a sudden, if you look at, you know, you look at the cold facts, you know, you, you drew away and lost at home. But there was, there was, there was sort of those, you know, three years. Seventy one, a bit different. Seventy one was was a strong Ajax side that. You know, for the last half an hour in Amsterdam, scored three goals and never really looked in danger beyond that, in my view. But uh, those three years, I guess, after the three years immediately after Lisbon and maybe getting all the way up to 72, there was there was real, real opportunity for a, for a, for a second, you know, indeed third or fourth uh, European Cup. And sad, sadly, the breaks maybe didn't go our way, but and that's where we are. But uh, we'll always have Lisbon, uh, Liam. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... I just kind of bring it on to the last few questions. So we've spoken a lot about you know, Harry's career in football and, and life before football. Uh, yeah. Then obviously his whole time at Celtic and a lot of the wider context of the Celtic team at that time. Um, and then so he told us about his um, experiences in America and then coming back to Scotland. So yeah. see, once kind of moving beyond football, um, we did briefly mention that Harry Hood is a well-known figure in like, the business world. Um, Say, so my yeah. friends knew that he owned a few different premises in Blantyre, um, and he would obviously owned I think, some hotels and restaurants and things. So, um, yeah. do you do you cover a lot of that side of his life, of his kind of business success after football? Uh, yeah, we cover that. Uh, certainly, we cover the. You know, life after football in the in the, the final couple of chapters. But again, going back, my, my first recollection of Harry being in that line of business was somebody mentioned that he was the he was the owner of Angels. So at that, that time, I didn't think any more on that Harry owned a pub, and you know, in common with many footballers. But again, when you start doing the research, it actually it actually goes back fifty years, quite incredibly. So and again, there's a Celtic connection. So maybe, maybe share this one. There's the guys are coming back, teams coming back from a match in Edinburgh. And there's a chance comment made by a player. I wouldn't say which player. <laughs> you can read that for yourself. There's a chance comment saying this particular place would do really well. I think gold mines the phrase it's used. It's up for sale. And uh, Harry, Harry always had quite a shrewd character. They had a you know, sharp business brain. Uh, background, Harry's wife's family's background was, was in pubs and whatever. And you know, so there was and Harry had worked in that. He'd worked and he worked when he played with Clyde's a part-timer. He'd worked in the sort of drinks business as a rep. So anyway, long story short. Harry decides to go in and, and make an effort to make make an offer, sorry, for his, you know, for the first premises for a place in Uddingston. And from that, you know, 50 years down the line, there's a, you know, basically an award-winning, you know, company with a, a portfolio of, you know, tremendous places in, you know, Lanarkshire, uh, all on, as, a, as a family, as a family business now being managed, you know, now being managed by Harry's family and, you know, it's a leg, another legacy to, you know, to, to pass on. So I think I touched on it earlier. Harry, Harry the footballer, the wonderful career, 
Harry the non-footballer also had a wonderful career in while again, most folk could buy the book, will buy the book with a view of them football and maybe within that most folk will be a review for Celtic and obviously the book is written appropriately but uh, there's, there's, you can't write Harry Hood's story without covering you know that you know that that business career that second career and again a lot of the a lot of the brilliant stories that came back funny maybe the funny stories in some cases came from folk who knew Harry from through you know through the, the you know the pub and hotel trade and going on holiday and meeting some other very very well-known characters who feature in the book uh, you know, and, and that, that was his life. And I guess talking to the family, one of the things that came out. I mean, my my take on it was in some in some ways, Harry was every bit as proud of his career with his the company's called Le- Lezany, which is the you know the first two letters of, of the names of of his kids, which is a lovely wee touch. But so Harry was equally, if not more, proud of the that second career, that Le- Lezany career, than perhaps any achieved in football. People might find that surprising. Until you look and see what they actually achieved and in that legacy it's left it's been left. Yeah, it, I mean there could there could even be a book written about just his business success <laughs> in a way to think how how well he'd done. It was um I I'd first looked into that side of things um because I was looking at it was quite a popular thing with Celtic players of that era to go into like the licensing trade. So like Billy McNeil had pubs. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, there's several different players that did. I think Danny McGrain as well. Um, yep. So I'd just looked into that thinking, you know, where are these pubs? Who owns them now? That type of thing. And I'd seen, yep. see that he'd got involved in that. But then even if some of the players had done well with their different pubs or restaurants and um, kind of business ventures, no one then took it to the level that, that Harry Hood did to go and make say it was in, into the millions it's quite um amazing to have such an amazing football career and then that level of success in the business world as well um yep. so just to sort of start to bring things to a close i see um harry had passed away in may 2019 i think it was the day after celtic had just won the treble treble Good. um that actually hit me quite hard because uh, at the time um, I was just finishing off my my second book that I was writing and I'd had in mind that I was going to do a book launch and I wanted to have an ex-player um, to come and speak at it and the one that always stood out for me was Bertie Old but I thought um, as much as I love Bertie Old that's kind of uh, you know, a, a, a real obvious character to have. Everybody always wants him to to talk at things. Um, and I thought maybe he might get fed up of, you know, always being asked. I, I know he's not that type of character at all and always seems to to love to be asked and love to talk to the fans. But I just thought maybe I'll go for somebody different. And I was thinking back, um, trying to get someone you know, outside the box that hasn't got the same recognition necessarily as as the what the Lisbon Lions have um sure. but that is as deserving or at least you know highly deserving of that recognition and Harry Hood was somebody that I'd had in mind and I'd, I knew that he was unwell um but then you know to I was kind of just focused on getting the book done first and thought see how things develop and uh, if he'd be up to it and then and see heard that news the day after the the Scottish Cup final um and so it was really kind of struck a chord with me actually at that time um so with his legacy um the boys ultras section um up at the opposite end of the stadium from the Green Brigade now up in section 444 uh yep. they've they've brought back some of his songs see that obviously you've used um Use one of his songs in the title, the book with twice as good, Harry Hood. Um, and there is other songs like Lou McCary, Kevin Barry, um, <laughs> get on to say Harry Hood. We had, and yeah. then uh, I've also heard the one of uh, to the tune of Robin Hood, that Harry Hood riding through the Glen. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, so he was obviously quite a, a hero with the support at the time. And then to see what, sorry, to hear his songs uh, making a comeback now with. And I mean, imagine most of the boys' section are, are quite 
quite young, so to have them singing his song, and I've, I've heard it as well at Party Access All Away under Ronnie Dyler. Um, I've heard a, a group of fans singing his songs as well. Um, That's I, I have to say, I said, no, no, I'm wearing the war tier, not a million miles away, but I haven't heard that. I haven't picked that up. That's brilliant. I'd seen it mentioned on uh, on the huddle board um, that they were singing. They said, what's their song? That group are singing up the top there. They said, they're singing it, something like Lou Macari, Kevin Barry. Um, <laughs> and then someone later wrote the, wrote the so words I, out. I, I generally have not heard that, Liam. That is brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. I mean, obviously it's a small I remember section the song of the... Well, but I've not heard them, so I haven't heard them for yeah. years. I, that brilliant. I, I, um, I personally heard the, the Twice as Good um, Harry Head song at, um, at Far Hill. So it was like, I think it was 2015. Um, I think we beat, we beat Partick 2-1. Um, and there was like you know not not the whole way in because a lot of the a lot of the youngsters um, you know and people from my kind of era don't yeah, really yeah, know yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, see, um, a lot of the people who weren't watching Celtic when Harry Hood was there, I'll put it across that way. <laughs> they they um. Hey, <laughs> They hadn't heard the song, so it was, you know, not sung on mass, but still quite a decent pocket of the support that was singing it. Um, That's my, love it. And say his legacy was was kind of brought up again when Musa Dembele scored a, a hat trick in the Glasgow derby recently, and then Musa Dembele um, was pictured in the press where he'd met up with him. Um, yeah. Did did you did you manage to speak to Musa Dembele at all or anybody? Involved with Celtic in recent years, of any with anything to do with his legacy. Well, without, without giving too much away, Musa, Musa and, and one other very prominent Celtic were, were on the list, and they sort of got beat by the beat by the deadline for that. But certainly we covered the uh, certainly we covered that that that, that meeting with, with Musa, which was really quite a lovely story because I talked about Angels earlier, which I don't know whether it's a flagship viewed as a flagship. Certainly, it's the one that, that, that I always really I always link Harry with. And as a wee surprise, as a wee surprise for Harry, they decided they were doing a, a major refurb, something like seven months' work, major refurb. And one of the things they'd done is they'd renamed the, you know, the main lounge as Harry's Bar, but they hadn't told them. So of course they had the they had the middle with Harry's Bar on it, and the you know the signage was all covered up. And then un, again, unbeknown to Harry, they had uh, they invited Musa along, you know, as you say, with with that connection you mentioned earlier. And Harry was clearly taken aback because the family had sent the family sent me a video that had been taken of the, the I guess the moment when when, when Harry sees what, what the hell's going on, and it's really quite touching. And he, he actually says to Musa, "I didn't know anything about this." And it's really yeah. Bear in mind, bear in mind, I'm watching that now when Harry's not with us. Yeah, it's actually very, 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 very poignant, quite emotional to be honest. So well, I know, I, saw, I actually saw um, so yeah. I saw after. See, Harry had passed away. That Musa Dembele yeah. was, um, you know, talking exactly. about it on Twitter and paying his tributes and stuff. So it shows he still his achievements um, with Celtic yeah. kind of is still remembered and quite relevant to, you know, players as recently as only a couple of seasons ago. Um, just my, it's a lovely. It was a lovely. I thought it was a lovely touch. A lovely wee, a lovely wee bit of Celtic theatre, if you like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just my my final question would be: Is there any kind of particular story or favourite story or something at all that you would want to share, just to give fans a taster without giving too much away? Just one kind of <laughs> thing that springs to mind or something. <laughs> well, pressure, then. Uh, <laughs> favorite favorite story without giving too much away. Okay, like behind the eight wall a wee bit here, so. I guess uh, the, the, the book, if you would imagine a biography and some of the, the highs and lows that we've touched on there, there's, there's quite a bit of humour in it. You know, looking at Harry's career as a footballer and, uh, you know, in the pub business and as a, as a man, there's certain principles that he stood by. One was he was very, I don't know, a man of great integrity, a man of real principles and morals, he would make a stand, but also a man of great humour and, and a man of one-liners. And one of the things, so Harry's thinking out loud here, as you can probably tell, but one of one of the, one of the comments I love from speaking to the family, we're talking Harry's. So as a boy, as a boy, a young man, Harry's favourite player was was Pelly. So and there's there were so many so many occasions over the years where, where they, they nearly faced one another, including in America, 
and just timing, it's like sliding doors, timing, just just beat them. But uh, Harry's a young guy, we talk about his uh, player. Harry, Harry had a dog, and they called the dog Pelly. And when people asked him why, why why the dog was called Pelly, he said, well, it's, it's, it's really only fair, because Pelly called his dog Harry Hood. Now, I, <laughs> I don't know about your sense of humour lies, but that, that really... <laughs> Harry had this dog, what about called Pelly? And I'm, I'm picturing Pelly running about the, you know, the beach at Copacabana and, and he's shouting this, you know, throwing this stick and he's shouting for Harry to bring it back. And, it's Harry <laughs> and another occasion we had, uh, you know, the, the locals going and the, talking about players and everything else and talking about Pelly and Harry said to him, well, I'm Pelly's, uh, Pelly, Pelly's actually staying with me tonight. He's actually staying over there. Yeah, that'll be right. No, no, Pelly's, Pelly's staying with me tonight. So the story goes that you know, Harry, straight face, deadpan, and uh, the following day, I think it was sitting Blantyre, perhaps, or Bells Hill, you know, Harry's turned up to the pub, so there's a, there's a queue waiting for Harry to arrive, arrive at the pub with Pelly, and of course, Harry opens his big Volvo estate or whatever, and uh, Pelly comes bounding out, not the Brazilian Pelly, of course, but the, the four-legged, the, fo the four-legged person, and again, done like a kipper, so, I say, I don't know where your sense of humour lies, but uh, <laughs> things like that. I, I love things like that, you know, just a bit of glass vision and I've kind of released a few things as well, but I'll, I'll save them for the book, and it's, it's that deadpan yeah. Glasgow stuff. The king of the one-liners, when he's, he, Harry, friends for, tended to be a man who had friends for, like, you know, a lifetime, friends for 40 years, and one of them described him when I was talking to him about, the, you know, the final chapters of the book, and he said, how would you describe him? King of the one-liners. He could just he could bury you with a one liner, you know. So yeah, <laughs> a man I never a man I never met, and I really, 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 really regret that I never had. But but see, writing his story and listening to his family and his friends, I actually feel like I know him. I feel like I get him. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that almost I think right at the very start when I'd asked about when you spoke to the family and it given you that um, kind of view into his life and his character. That that's yeah. almost like the perfect answer with the, the ending there, with the way you said that you feel as if you know him and through all the different people that were close to him. Um, I mean, it, it's a shame, see, that you couldn't speak to Harry himself, but um, yeah. without him being here, I think that's as, as close as you can ever get to, to really building up the full picture. And um, that's what I was quite keen to get across to the, to the listeners as well, that it, it kind of goes beyond being a football book or just the the few years at Celtic as much as that's a big part of the story and an important part of it this whole other side to him as a as a man and the thing I found quite funny as well is that when you talk about his hero being Pele um and with the dog and everything that for a lot of people maybe Harry Hood was their hero um and yes. we don't necessarily think of our heroes as having heroes themselves so it's quite strange to think this this guy that played in front of you know crowds of over a hundred thousand still having his own heroes, you know himself in the background. Um, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. I just uh, wrap things up by just saying so the the book's obviously called Harry Hood Twice as Good. Uh, it's yep. published by the Celtic Star. Um, so you just tell people listening um, where they can get a copy of that and uh, when the book's available. Yep, absolutely. In common with all the Celtic Star books, you'll, you'll be able to buy it directly from CelticStarBooks.com. It'll also be available on Amazon and in all the Celtic, you know, Football Club official outlets. So that's the, the main thing. We'll probably also have it available to from to, to buy from recently. You know, given as I say, there's a you know that a huge part of Harry's life is is tied up in there. So the, the family are very keen that they can do as. Book will retail for £20. £1 of every sale will go to Marie Curie, which I know we haven't touched on here, but uh, Harry, Harry, even after he was diagnosed and he was dealing with his illness, I talked earlier on about being a man of great integrity. Harry was still then in a position to go and raise with his family tens of, literally tens of thousands of pounds for the cancer charities of Beach and Marie Curie. So when we said we really wanted to do something for charity here, uh, the, the Hood family were quite unanimous that Marie Curie was to benefit. So that's, again, something that we're very proud of here. If you like, it feels like Harry's legacy is living on a wee bit through here. So available from the, all the usual outlets. I'm cautious always, always in terms of giving a, an exact date in, in term, you know, before the printer has, has confirmed that and I have that level of confidence of we. But if we're talking, talking about the end of, end of October and early November, 
uh, the book will be out. And obviously, if you follow us on Harry Hood Book at uh, Twitter or on Celtic Star or on Bill of Vogue, my personal Twitter, then we'll be updating that as we go along. But uh, the, the, we, we are working on the basis that the book will be available at the end of October, uh, maybe 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 into the first week in November. That's that's probably <laughs> that's, that's probably and as much commitment you get uh, from me tonight, Elliot. Yeah. I mean, pe people can um, pre-order the book as well, can't they, from CelticStarbooks.com. Um, so, of course, very, very remiss of me, we can pre-order the book. We've already got a significant amount of pre-orders in, and they can pre-order now. Yeah, and, that, and that's obviously point signed point and personalised as well. Yeah, that'll be signed and personalised. Put your dedication. A number of people already have asked me to do this. So, CelticStarbooks.com. You know, you, you can let, let us know what you want. We are, we're a very, you know, we, everything we do, we do ourselves in here. So if there's something you want, then we'll make sure you, you get that. It's, just, it's as simple as that, which is exactly the same way we've approached the other uh, three books in the, if you like, in our portfolio so far. Yeah. That's it. Well, the uh, last thing to say is just thanks a lot for coming on and sharing so much kind of Celtic history and stories of not just Harry Hood, but um, of, of the whole club. Um, through that really successful period um, and, and a really interesting period in the club's history as well. So hopefully a lot of listeners will, having heard these kind of stories and some of the humour, um, all the things on the pitch and off it as well, uh, hopefully a lot of people will go and place their pre-orders um, or perhaps pick up a coffee once it comes out. And see, so I would urge everybody to, to go and do that. So thanks a lot for coming on to speak to us tonight. My pleasure, Leo. Thanks for having me, sir. Thank you.